Rebbe Tzim Weinberg, Zichrona Levracha. In uh, many of your campus tours, in the days when feminism was really taking off, she would be asked, why can't a woman be an Orthodox rabbi? And she would answer, without batting an eyelash, I'm an Orthodox rabbi. And what a rabbi she was. And to begin with, she was married to Rabbi Noah. To most of you, Rabbi Noah is a legend. Truth is, he was a legend to us too. In the early years of marriage, he was learning day and night, literally. He lived on no dose. He slept three hours a night. And the Rebison took care of everything. And then when he moved on, he's busy traveling the world, raising money to save the Jewish people. For so much of the time, she was a single parent. To Bali Ayanara, a nice-sized family of characters. I mean, you can't be children of Rav Noach and not be characters. And for that matter, of the Rebbe's neither. So between her husband and the family, I mean, that should have been overwhelming enough. But that was nothing. She had to teach. The way I got to Aish, for those of you that never heard this story, as I was studying at the mirror, it was Gan Eden. Get a message one day, Rebbitz and Weinberg wants to speak to you. I'd heard of Reb Noach, in fact, my first Yomim Noroim in the mirror was actually the year that Rav Noach opened Aish and he came with the first group of Talmidim to Davin in the mirror. <laughs> the rabbits and I never really heard of. Read about her in the Rolling Stone article. So I went over. And Rebbe Weinberg says to me, I'm opening a seminary. You're teaching halacha. You're getting $10 an hour. The only thing she was willing to discuss was exactly which hours I was going to teach, because she did not want to interfere with my learning siddharah. So I started with three hours, bein asdarim. And then it grew. I gave a class at 7.30 in the morning. Later only to find out that she gave a class before me at 6.30. What was her success? What was the secret? She was great with the feminists. You know why? With all the talk of feminism and all the feminist leaders that they, these women got to meet, 
They had never seen a more powerful woman than Robinson Weinberg. Fearless. She had her convictions resolve. No compromise. What's right is right. To an extreme. Couldn't budge her. But she wasn't a feminist. I have a look at her family. and the years of mysterious nephesh for her husband's learning. And she really made the statement, she opened the school, the seminary, Iyat, in Kiryat Sons. That was wild. You had totally irreligious women walking into an ultra-Orthodox neighborhood. If you know Kiryat Sons, it was, it's two streets, two rows of buildings. And in those days, people didn't have dryers. There were clotheslines from one side of the street to the other. And there you could see, you know, 13 pairs of underwear, 13 pairs of pajamas on each clothesline. The locals had problems. Why are you bringing pretzels to our neighborhood? She had a supporter. She rented an apartment for the school. Rev. Herschel Zach, Zechorn Levracha, is a grandson of the Chavetz Chaim. And he told the neighbors, what are you doing to save the non flow Why did she want it in Kirat Sanz? To be close to home. The school is to be an extension of her home. This is not a university. Her 6.30 class was at home. She was more powerful than any feminist, and not at all a feminist. But she believed in the power of Jewish women. The school was called Iyat Rosh Hashanah, Isha Yiras Hashem He Sis And that was what the school was about. Yiras Hashem. You do only what Hashem wants, nothing else, no compromise, and the highest standards. Now, one second. We're dealing with women off the street. Later, in later years, they separated, they made a jewel program. But initially, you know, women that had absolutely no exposure to Judaism, often no interest in Judaism, would be brought in. So I asked her, what should I be teaching? What do you teach beginners? I'm teaching halacha. You teach them everything. You teach them everything. No compromises, no leniencies. You teach them the real thing. That's what sells. I thought it was insane. <laughs> and indeed, I sort of translated the chaburis and halacha that I gave in the mirror, I translated them into English. My translations weren't really sufficient. The Rebbe's used to pass me notes during class, speak English. And it was unbelievable. Girls started observing. It didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. The Rebbe's maintained. A Jewish woman has a natural fear of Hashem inside. A Jewish woman wants to do the Ratzon Hashem. Give them truth. Nothing watered down. No compromise. It may take some time, but they'll catch fire. 
And that's what happened. I remember I was teaching a class. It was, I mean, it was, I, I, yeah, I thought it was hilarious. Rebbe said, teach everything. You're unconscious. I was teaching Tefillah's Kaelin. The laws of Tefillah's Kaelin. And halachas are just, you know, when you put a, exactly how to hold a cup when you put it in the mikveh, a glass, how you hold a glass. And it's got to be clean. Halachas of chatzitza, well, it depends how much it's covering. Do you want it there? Do you not want it there? I, I wondered, you know, these, these, these women must think I'm coming from the moon. So I remember this is the class on, on the halachas of chatzitza in Tevilas Keli. So one of, the, one of the beginners speaks up and says, you know, the Rebison just finished a class on proofs of Torah min HaShemayim, of the truth of Torah Shemal Peh. I wasn't so convinced. But you know what convinced me? The laws of Tefillah's Caitlin. No human being in his right mind could have made this up. Again, I thought it was insane. It worked. It worked. You know, I, I developed a class of the philosophy of Shabbos. I thought that would sell. One woman over the years said she thinks it may have affected her keeping Shabbos. What got them to keep Shabbos was learning Yuga Shabbos. You have a whole discussion of what is Borer and what's not Borer. Did you turn the light on? Torah Hashem, it worked. It's wild. But it was just not, it wasn't just a matter of cure. What expectations could you have from women? And she used to say, women more than men, you can push them and push them and make demands. They've got so much strength. Face it, a woman can carry a child for nine months with all of the, the nausea and inconvenience and can do this over and over again. And kind of a house full of kids and work from morning to night and still have a smile on her face. There's nothing women can't do. And she used to make demands. Some of them were getting on and they wanted to get married. No, you're not holding yet. There were rules. It was observance, it was knowledge, it was midos. You gotta be ready for it. And then whom to marry? He's gotta be a Talmud Chal. He's gotta love learning. If she didn't feel the guy was enough of a Talmud Chacham or had enough of a love for learning, the Rebison would boycott the wedding. In one case, she actually threw one of her first students out of the school. She married a great guy. But after the wedding, he was not going to spend time in Kolum. Instead, he was going to go to, to Kiev immediately. She was thrown out of the school. I mean, I, he, he was a great guy, he still is. But how do I pass up such a shit up? So get him to learn. Make a condition with him. You can do it. I remember there was someone who had become from in the school, she was going back. And she was really afraid she was gonna meet her boyfriend again. And she was afraid that she just wouldn't be strong enough. So the Rebison make, made her take a vow. She asked me, what is the most severe vow you can take that cannot be annulled? It was a neder al das rabbit. <laughs> she took a vow that if she breaks halacha with him, she will not shower for 30 days. She didn't break it. <laughs> Oh, 
But there were stories that were just unbelievable. At the time of the dedication of this building, a lot of people came. A lot, lots of people. Some affiliation. One of them decided to spend a week at Iyat. By the time the week was over, she was fully observant. The problem was her husband was in the States and knew nothing about this. <laughs> Once he got wind of what was going on, he said, I'm coming to get you. He's going to take her back. So the Rebbitson helped with the negotiations. They came to an agreement. She is going to be totally observant. He doesn't have to keep anything, but he must respect everything, not break any halacha in the home. The one compromise the Rebison was open to. She didn't believe in wearing shaitals. She believed in real head covering that doesn't look like hair. The one compromise was when they go out with his friends, she can put on a shaital. That was the big compromise. After a week in Iyat. We had another one. There was a group of Russians. This was after the fall of the Iron Curtain. So Rav Noah had this brilliant idea. There are now lots of Russian professors, Jewish Russian professors, that are unemployed. Let's pay them to come to Israel and study Judaism, and then offer them jobs of teaching Judaism in Russia. So they got a group of people that were professors there. They were, I mean, they're really, really good people. They came with their wives. The men studied here. We had a program for them, and the women went to Iyat. Well, the women grew very quickly. So I remember there was a wedding that everyone was invited to. So a yeshiva wedding, and they invited everybody around. So this one woman who became totally from without her husband realizing it was now going to see her husband at the wedding. Here too, the Rebbitson allowed her to get a shaitel for the wedding. He didn't know what hit him. He wasn't sure what he does believe in, what he doesn't believe in, and his wife dresses like an Orthodox Jew like an ultra-Orthodox Jew. These things were not uncommon. The Rebetzin was strong, determined, uncompromising, and warm. As said, this was her family. They were part of the house. They also had an open credit card to the local Makolit and can eat whatever they wanted to, whenever they wanted to. This was family. The school was never too big. That wasn't because it couldn't have been big. It had to remain a family. The Rebbe's had to be on top of everybody and everything. But I got to tell you, although her determination, her strength was impressive to the feminists, if you really want to know what it was like, so I got to tell you a story. There was a time that Reb Noach decided to close Iyat because it was too expensive. Aish was supporting it. The Rebison was not fundraising. It was a small school, but it cost a fortune. She employed, she had a collection of the best women teachers in Yerushalayim. They had the best, the best Ulpan teacher, the best history teacher, the best Chumash teacher, the best Hashkafa teacher. It, it was just the collection. It was a, an all-star cast. 
and she paid for them. And there were private tutorials. The girls have to learn Hebrew. It cost a fortune. So Rav said he couldn't do it anymore. So he closed the school. So the Rebison sent me to negotiate on her behalf. I had never really personally met Reb Noach before. And I got blown away. He gave me the whole spiel of what he believes in. I had never heard it firsthand before. I was totally blown away. And then he makes an offer. I'm going to reopen Iat, no limitations, with one condition. You come to Aish. That's how I got here. So I was at Aish part time, was he at part time? For Aish already, I had to leave Kolo first half day. And with time, I got more involved here with the students. So it got to a point where Ibn said, I think it's more important that you spend your time here than you do in Iyad. The Rebison wouldn't hear from it. So they had a very close family relationship, a very close relationship as a family with Rav Shach. So they agreed, I'll go ask Rav Shach. So I went to Rav Shach. First thing he asked me is, Vozok Neach, what does Rav Noach say? So I told him. Do you think he's right? He's right. He said, you know, they'll find someone else for you yet. You should stay at age full time. Fine, that was the decision. A week later, I am summoned back to Rav Shach. The Rebbitson came, I'm no match for her. <laughs> she does this all the time. I give Psachim, she thinks they're too liberal. Her reasoning is so clear and uncompromising. She's so passionate. This is Rav Shah. Rav Shah I mean, aside from his godless, he was the most passionate leader Klaal Yisrael had for a while. He was outspoken. So, no match for her. Let's work out a compromise. So it's not just the feminists that were impressed. This was the strongest woman anyone had ever met. in that combination of not being a feminist, <laughs> of being a mother, of being a Jewish woman the way one's supposed to, and being so powerful. That's what made the difference. That's what made her so unique. And that's why the students she made from have done so much for Claudius. She got them acquainted with their own abilities. She got them acquainted with the strength of being a Jew and a Jewish woman. And they learned from her to stop at nothing. It's the end of an era. She was one of a kind. They don't make them like that wholesale. They don't make them like that, period.
I know we're going to do it for the women. But we got to learn. Yeah, you can do anything. Between Reb who didn't accept human weakness and the Rebbitzin who believed in the endless potential and endless strength that the Jewish neshama has got and has the ability to filter through between the two of them. We gotta learn to be big and strong. Everything we know is right. Our relationship with Hashem, our love for his learning, our love for the Jewish people. It's gotta be endless. Our passion, our passion just has to grow and grow. There's nothing we can do if we take Hashem seriously. Rav Noach and the Rebbitzin each, each in their own way. They're two different personalities. Each in their own way. Showed us that if you take Hashem seriously, there's nothing you won't be able to do. Hashem, who gave us Rebbes and Weinberg, should give us the strength, the Seichel, and help us with the Yerush Shemai to do what he created us for. For us to be close to him in everything we do and bring every Jew back to him. Without excuses. Nothing's too big. Nothing's too difficult. Nothing's not doable. It's all Hashem anyway. It should be a male Yosher for the yeshiva that she was most her nefesh for. And for everything we stand for. Let the days come when there won't be any more suffering, loss. Only good. The world will leach its shlemus. The name of Hashem will just shine from all of humanity and all of existence.